David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, March 26th, 2024. Time for another show, and uh, we're rolling on underway. Plenty happening, of course, this morning. Plenty that we'll miss this morning, no doubt about that as well. It being a Tuesday, we miss this. We miss having the government on the brink of a shutdown. What are we going to talk to Joan McCarter about? Well, the next shutdown, of course. But that won't be happening, as you learned last week, until the fall, which they sort of casually mentioned last week in some of the coverage. Well, this pushes the uh, chances of the next government shutdown off until the fall, which is the end of the fiscal year, which is to say that they are writing that you should expect them as a matter of course to fail to uh, adopt the budget in time for next fiscal year, which uh, is also likely to happen. It'll still be a re- – well – I don't know. We'll talk about that today, too. Uh, Ordinarily, you'd say, well, it's normally expected to still be a Republican-controlled House of Representatives come end of September, beginning of October of this year, 2024. We'll be heading into an election season, to be sure. But there will be no chance, ordinarily, of reconstituting the House as uh, perhaps Democratic-controlled until the following January, when the new members are sworn in. But, but... There was, uh, did we manage to get it on the record yesterday? I think so, yes. That's right. We did talk about the resignation of yet another Republican from the House bringing their margin to spare to just one vote. I think what uh, we were looking at, a 217 to 14 split or 213 split in the House. And, uh, Speculation already beginning about whether or not there'll be another Republican leaving. They pointed out, uh, a couple of observers did, that the date given, I'll have to go back and remember who it was. I mean, it was an important personage, too, who uh, actually uh, ended up resigning most recently. And we, we, we got stuck on the fact that this was a person who had just been rewarded with a uh, a chairmanship of a committee that they essentially committed, well, they created out of thin air, as they can do in the House, but a a dumb committee to investigate something, something about the Communist Party of China. So they get to yell about communism. And it was Brian Higgins, right, who uh, resigned and or, or submitted a letter of resignation designating his last date in the seat, I think was something like, Hmm. Oh no, I wasn't. I'm thinking of somebody else who's uh, get who's gone and is uh, set to be replaced. Wow, I'm already off track. Gallagher, Mike Gallagher, was the one who just resigned. Uh, I just was scanning another article mentioning that on April 30th there's a special election to replace former Representative Brian Higgins, uh, a Democrat, and uh, I, so I'm looking at one or another of reports of all the people who are designed, you know, ready to be replaced in the House or who have left their seat vacant. Uh, The mention, though, of uh, Gallagher was that he was, uh, he had rigged his resignation to be one day after his home state, Wisconsin, did we decide it was, uh, would be able to uh, hold a special election to fill the seat. It was in a long gap, like late April all the way through January, there's going to be no representation for this district. It just happens. There, you, you don't. The governor doesn't get to appoint anybody. That doesn't happen in the House. There are only elections to the House. But the rules in Wisconsin are such that had he resigned just slightly earlier, they could hold a special election to fill the seat from, you know, April through the following January. But as it is, uh, so this was essentially done intentionally to keep, I presume, to keep the seat vacant. And now widely being viewed as a parting shot, a parting middle finger to the Republican leadership and saying, you're going to have to do without this vote in the sli- already in the slimmest of margins in the House, uh, and you're going to have to do without it all the way through the election. So that was something rather remarkable as well. Uh, so we can talk about that 
because the margins are so narrow that people are beginning to, you know, ponder, gossip, wish, cast, what have you about, well, what if, you know, what if they're, what if they keep going? What if there are suddenly more Democrats in the House than Republicans? What happens? And I don't know if I've ever seen it happen in the House. Uh, so I'm not certain how they would handle it exactly, but the, the the leadership has changed. The majority has changed hands in the middle of a session in the Senate within recent memory. Uh, maybe one of the memories is not that recent, but uh, I was alive. That's recent memory. Uh, so I think it's happened twice in relative recent history. And they handle it, you know, like you would think the Senate would. They come to an agreement, a power sharing agreement, et cetera. I'm not certain that they could actually manage to hammer out such an agreement in the House. Different players, many more of them. But they'd kind of have to because eventually you'd, you'd, you'd face a vote that Republicans just couldn't sustain. If there weren't more Republicans present and voting and, and musterable in the House, then they'd have to come to some different kind of arrangement. I've been thinking about that, and maybe we can talk to Joan about that, uh, just sort of pondering, well, hmm. Uh, ordinarily, in the, in the ordinary course of business, whether the House is closely divided or not, one of the first things that they do each day is to uh, vote to, once they convene. They vote uh, pro forma, usually, to, to well, they hold the vote, uh, but to approve the journal of the previous day, not the congressional record per se. That's actually a different publication, but the journal that just keeps uh, loose notes about happenings that day, what bills passed, how much was, things that were introduced, things that were passed, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, like notes to a uh, or minutes of a meeting or something, as opposed to a transcript of the meeting, say, which is the congressional record. Anyway, the House has to approve the journal from the previous day, and they usually use that as a kind of a test vote, a, an attendance taking. How many people are here? Who's here? Who's not? Uh, so in case there are close votes coming up, the leadership of both parties gets some idea of who's in town, because with 435 members, there's usually, you know, Hmm, four to ten people just absent for the day for whatever reason. Just kind of the statistics of working in the House. And so, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an ordinarily the majority's responsibility to approve the journal, so they all vote yes on it. And the minority's got a responsibility, I guess, to see that the journal's approved as well, but they don't have to provide the votes for it. And they just use it as a, as a no vote, not because they're angry about what was recorded in the journal necessarily, although sometimes that's the case. If you're the if you're the minority uh, in the House, you don't get to control much ordinarily. This minority has done pretty well with it, but ordinarily you're not in control. And I don't know. So I guess they're malcontents just normally, but they just use it as a the majority party vote yes, the minority party vote no, and the leadership of those two parties can watch the tallies come in. And watch the board up uh, top that tells them who's voting how. And they can check on who's in town today. How many votes can we count on if this or that is brought to a vote? So, you know, there's a test vote every day anyway. I was wondering, uh, why not right along with it, right along with the test vote, start, I don't know, some other kind of test vote, uh, I guess depending on the outcome of this one. If... Uh, I, I, the, the, I guess I would say that the whole situation would be tipped off by the journal vote. Like, if it was just a bad day for Republicans and a relatively good day for Democrats, there are a couple of Republicans uh, with colds and everybody's in good health with the Democrats, let's say, or Republicans have COVID because they don't like wearing masks and Democrats don't because they're willing to wear them. And I don't, that's a generalization. But then, uh, they hold the journal vote and suddenly, hey, the journal isn't going to be approved. What are we going to do? I don't know whether that matters at all. I don't know what happens if you don't approve the journal. Maybe some votes would switch just to get the thing out of the way. But you'd get an inkling right there. There's a functional majority of Democrats on the floor right now. What's going on and what should we do about it? And how sustained is that majority? I mean, at this stage of the game, Republicans could head home 
and just not tell the leadership and just say, I'm not resigning. I'm just not going to work anymore. Office space. I'm just going to stop going and not bother anymore. I don't know. It could happen. And it only has to happen with one or two of them before you say, hmm, well, there are uh, more Republicans sworn in to existing seats in the House of Representatives, but they're just not here on a consistent basis and consistently more Democrats than Republicans are showing up. What should we do about that? I don't know. So I'll take a little sip of coffee and continue to ponder it. I'm late today with getting to the microphone with the coffee and uh, just coffee update. I've finished the chocolate macadamia nut lion coffee roasting company uh, magnificence from Hawaii. Thank you very much to Judy Vincent who sent that out to us. And uh, but before I start the next specialty coffee, I have some other coffee at home to finish up. And it's, you know, it's garbage. It's junk. It's uh, it's instant coffee. I, I don't treat myself ordinarily to the really good stuff. So uh, one, it's a little jarring to go back to. But two, I got some I have some uh, milk to use up that I haven't been using in the other coffees because I have flavored creamers woo, for those things. But meanwhile, it's like eh, you better use this milk up or it's going to go bad. So I switched back to the other coffee mostly to use the milk up. So that's the uh, update. But it 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 takes up extra time in the morning, believe it or not. And so I've arrived here with the cup and as annoying a sound as that is, maybe you can view it as pleasant background noise and make it feel like you're uh, cozying up to a fire in the middle of winter. It's still pretty cold out there. And uh, sipping your hot chocolate while you're listening to me describe the destruction of uh, the country, the planet, uh, what have you. So where were we? Oh, yes. Well, I should save the rest of this discussion, I guess, for when we have a chance to go over it with Joan, if she's interested in this. And I'm not certain that she is, but, uh, you know, uh, it could be at least uh, an interesting uh, fantasy to entertain in passing. But, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens if it just becomes the case that on the regular there are more Democrats around than Republicans, but nobody's resigned those seats. And then, of course, what happens if more seats Get, you know, more Republicans resign, and there's just, even if they can bring everybody every day, there's just more Democrats in the House than Republicans. What's it like to switch majorities midstream in the House? Uh, so, you know, there's a couple of options, but we'll think about those things and uh, go over them perhaps. We'll see if we get any indication from Joan ahead of time. Whether and nah, I don't really want to talk about that. Then we can speculate about that on our own. In the meantime, big weird news in the region as uh, the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. And there are a lot of Francis Scott Key everythings everywhere because he wrote a song. And you know how it is in this country. You write a song. It's like the Taylor Swift of his day. Not really. But... Francis Scott Key, of course, the the big song that he's famous for writing, penning the lyrics that became the national anthem and having done so while watching the bombardment of Fort McHenry, not Fork McHenry, that's a different place, Fort McHenry in Baltimore. Uh, and so as a result, lots of Francis Scott Key stuff in the region. There's a Francis Scott Key Bridge, the Key Bridge, we just call it the Key Bridge, in D.C., that's not what we're talking about. This is a Francis Scott Key Bridge, which is part of the uh, route interstate uh, 695 outer beltway of Baltimore, an enormous mile long span over the what is it, the Patapsco River or something? Anyway, at the mouth of the Baltimore Harbor, and a gigantic container ship has smashed into the bridge and collapsed it which is astonishing all by itself there were it was in the middle of the night so thankfully like the volume of traffic wasn't too bad but they definitely like lost cars and trucks and things that fell into the water nightmare scenario uh there was a repair crew working on the bridge and those guys went into the water or at least some of them did there's a whole rescue operation going on it's about 1 30 in the morning when this happened this ship, I guess, looks like it lost power and just was scrambling to try to correct itself. It was, I guess, adrift, fully loaded, and just smashed into the thing and took the bridge out 
and it's weird, you know, Twitter now, uh, Twitter and uh, other social media jammed with people who are, you know, uh, one, people who are overnight, you know, shipping and infrastructure and tensile strength of steel experts kind of people. Uh, and, of course, people complaining about the other people who are all, all of a sudden overnight experts in whatever it is that's going on. So a free for all there. That's for sure. Uh, but uh, interesting to watch people wake up to weird head. Even the headlines about this disaster are weird. It's like, it's like the people who cover Congress are covering this thing, you know, and they say uh, Congress fails to uh, approve budget. And it's like, well, you know, Republicans blocked the budget or filibustered this or that. You know, why don't you say that sort of thing? People were waking up to uh, key bridge collapses you know baltimore bridge collapses uh you know dozens is uh you know feared lost or whatever the you know whatever they do in the headlines and people waking up to that and saying gosh our infrastructure is so terrible in this country and we need to repair it and, and that's all true but it's the bridge didn't collapse it wasn't like oh, i'm so old and crumbly and i've been not maintained very well a gigantic container ship fully loaded with you know, who knows what smashed into it and you're not going to survive that. And people, that was another thing about well, people wondering about that. Like you can't just, the, how, how heavy are these ships that just smashed and took out this bridge, but a fully loaded, you know, ocean going container ship. I have no idea. I'm sure there are experts out there or fake experts who Wikipedia looked up how much of, but apparently if you smash into the pilings of a bridge with a boat like that, that's it that just takes the bridge out. So that's pretty amazing. And it's a fairly heavily traveled artery around the region. Uh, I guess, luckily, it happened in the middle of the night when traffic was light, but people are going to have to look for another way to get where they're going because it was a big, long span over a big expanse of water. And we're going to have to, I don't know. Then, of course, there's people speculating about, well, why is the ship, that, who owns it? And what country and is it uh, intentional and the ship made a weird turn and it just it just looks like there's a power failure in the boat. And they're like, I, I don't know. Looks like we're going to crash. Could there be more to it? Uh, sure. We'll find out in the coming days, I guess. But it doesn't it doesn't feel like it was anything other than, oh, no, this is just a giant uh, boating accident. So anyway, we'll see whether that changes. Uh, there's a lot of things you could re-examine in the aftermath of uh, the the actual events and find a different interpretation of, and some of them are waiting for that interpretation uh, right now. Let's see. There's a couple of things to share with you. Uh, one, I guess, since leaving the air yesterday, the big development, since we spent so much time talking about Trump and his bonds, his... Uh, Appeal bond in New York, that whole picture changed over, well, overnight, yes. But during the course of the day, almost immediately, I don't know what time they had their bond hearing scheduled, but immediately after our show, just to screw us up. And the big news is that an appeals court in New York said, I'll tell you what, uh, instead of having to put up $454 million for your appeal bond, you can instead put up just $175 million dollars for the appeal bond and i presumably that's a much more reachable number uh lots of outrage because damn it you know we thought we had it to where uh donald trump was finally gonna his head was gonna explode because there was no way he could make the 454 million dollars i guess there's still some question about how he could make the 175 given how much trouble he had putting up i think under 100 for the e Jean carroll case but um, I don't know. There hasn't been much discussion of that. And apparently it's uh, something he's able to do. It was weird watching the reaction to the appeals court, mostly because uh, they gave him an extra 10 days. They had given him 30 days to come up with the $454 million for the bond. That obviously was never going to happen. And then he hit the last day, which was yesterday. Then they reduced it to 175 Uh and I guess in the fit of reasonableness, they decided, well, we'll give you 10 days to come up with the 175. But you just had 30 days to come up with 454. Presumably you made it to 175. 
somewhere along the line and you were looking for the rest. So do you need the extra 10 days? Or was he looking for it all in one lump sum? No one would give it to him. And he was basically sitting at zero. And he needed 10 days to put together the 175. And we'll see whether or not he's able to do that. It looks like it. Uh, there was some reporting available that helped sort of clarify uh, what was going on and how much of it was, oh my God, we just can't punish a rich guy versus you know anybody else and other people who have, I mean, there's the, the, the record is replete with stories of, of poor people who, you know, never made it out of jail or even died in jail waiting, awaiting trial because they couldn't put up a thousand dollar bond. And, you know, nobody got the chance to go to the court and say, gosh, it's impossible for me to raise that money. Why don't you reduce it? They don't, they don't do that for everybody else. So what's going on here? Lots of different factors. If you really look at it as a pragmatist, uh, you know, there's, for instance, everyone began speculating, well, okay, uh, he'll have to sell property in order to put up the bond, or they might seize property because he can't put up the bond. And by the way, what the hell is the bond exactly all about anyway? Uh, and uh, I don't think we, I don't think I totally understood exactly what it was. It, it, apparently it's not that unless you put up the bond, you can't have your appeal, which is kind of what they were making it sound like. And I, that was kind of odd, struck me as odd, because, you know, well, what have we rigged it so badly that only rich people can appeal their cases these days? That's the case with paying the lawyers, certainly. You're effectively limited in your appeals. But are you really barred from access to the court to uh, appeal a matter of law just because you can't raise bond money to do it? And the, the answer is, well, not really. It's not like that. You're You're still entitled to your appeal, but it's a matter of... Uh, how they handle the eventuality of having to enforce the judgment. You've just lost your case in the trial court. There's a judgment against you for, you know, whatever it is. In this case, we'll say a million dollars. A judgment against you for a million dollars. You want to appeal. That's fine. But there's a chance you might win and there's a chance you might lose on appeal. But the, what they're asking you to do is put up a bond to guarantee the ability of the plaintiff who won the case, who won the million dollars from you, to collect on that money should you lose your appeal. Because one of the things you can do is file for an appeal and then abscond and take off. And what happens? And now there's a judgment against you and it's enforceable because you'll lose by default uh, for not showing up at your appeal. But where's the money? So this is really all about, you know, preventing people from packing up the house and leaving in the middle of the night in order to avoid payment. You got to put up the money and then appeal. And you can still appeal, but the alternative for people who don't have money to put up the bond is, all right, as a matter of law, you can appeal, but in the meantime, you need to start paying this judgment. The, the, the court system says you owe this million dollars to this person. Start paying and if you win your appeal later, you can sue and make them pay you back. But, you know, if you want to avoid that hassle, you put up the bond instead. You have your appeal. Very often the plaintiff won't start, you know, collecting on this thing until the issue is settled and claim to the money is established and, and firmed up. So that's what's going on there. And often also other people pointing out, uh, well, again... Uh, the bond issue is, uh, it's not necessarily meant to be punitive and it doesn't prevent the appeal from going forward. So it's not exactly that, uh, it, it was all over if they held them to the $454 million. In fact, I thought there was a good summary of the explanations that were bouncing around yesterday up at Daily Coast. Uh, Andrew F. Cockburn actually had put this up and posted it and it was on the recommended list and I thought it was a good summation of what was going on. Um, I guess a good title to, to catch eyes and get people to come and read it. Reducing the bond, it says, was not rich man's privilege. And he explains this way, look, uh, just, you know, just a chat with everybody. I'm bummed out 
that the Trump organization isn't heading into bankruptcy today. And that doesn't mean, though, that the decision was a bad one or an insupportable one, I guess I would say. Putting up a bond during appeal, he explains here, is to make sure that the losing party or their money doesn't disappear during the delay between the initial judgment and losing that appeal, if you, if in fact lose that appeal. For example, suppose, oh, uh, look, they're going to do the same thing, except suppose you win a judgment against me, uh, not me, but Alexander, uh, is it, uh, Andrew, Andrew Cockburn. Alexander Cockburn is another journalist type guy. But Andrew, suppose you get a judgment against him for $10,000. You never get that against me. I mean, you'll never see that money if you win that against me. Anyway, but uh, uh, anyway, if uh, Andrew says, if I appeal and skip town, you're out of luck without a bond. Anyway, instead, I have to come up with enough money that if I lose the appeal, you automatically get your award. If I win the appeal, I get the bond money back and you get nothing. The point isn't to screw me, Andrew. That's never the point to screw Andrew, I don't think. Uh it is to make sure you are protected because the assumption is you have won the case. Does the state of New York need to have the full amount of the bond to make sure the Trumps pay up if they lose their appeal? Could the Trumps sell all their property and move the money to a secret Swiss bank account? And the answer there is, uh, well, at least it's, it's purported to be absolutely not. And it's a good point, right? Keep in mind that we were talking about the difficulties with liquidating that property that Trump would have or even the state would have if they if he defaulted and they seized the property. And then it's like ah, the headache of trying to liquidate major properties, major, major properties like Trump Tower or golf clubs, etc. You know, can you sell them? Can you turn them into cash? Can you do anything with them? Trump might not have been able to do that either. It's actually quite a headache that they avoid this way. Sup fam, it's your boy Darwin, aka Darwin underscore Darko, aka the most reasonable man in America, aka JITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spaceman vs. Space Cadets and we need to talk about Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organizations strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept the life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kagor in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, let's see. Oh, well, look at this. Uh, just to bring you up to date on how bad Twitter is, the... Uh, 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 Twitter weirdos are all out there blaming the, uh, the, the ship disaster having hit the, and destroyed the key bridge in Baltimore. Uh, they're all looking for ways to just say, um, oh, well, maybe the shipping company promotes DEI in their company. And because they are anti-white in their business practices, they've hired substandard, I don't know what, are we supposed to say the skipper, the first mate and the skipper too? Though they did their very best to make the others comfortable in this Baltimore area mess, uh, were diversity hires and therefore unqualified to steer the ship. And that's why, blah, blah. I mean, what a pit of racist garbage Twitter has become. But it's become that on purpose. So what can you do? All right. Well, let's see. Other things to uh, catch up on. We were, what, in the middle of talking about the bond uh, change for Trump and reading Andrew Cockburn's popular diary on Daily Coast about it and describing the situation. Uh, and uh, we had just gotten around to the part where we were 
saying, yeah, even beforehand, before they changed the numbers, um, as they really were contemplating, well, are we going to have to seize Trump properties and sell them to either fulfill, I guess, not to meet the bond obligation, but to fulfill the obligation of paying the judgment. $454 million. And uh, realistically, thinking about the prosecutors, you know, while they might be sort of politically uh, or, 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 or professionally licking their lips at the prospect of uh, getting their target and proving their case and disgorging these ill-gotten gains from the Trump organization, it's not entirely clear that they would be able to pay themselves, the state, you know, uh, who got the judgment here, uh, you, you know, you're, you're owed $454 million and you can seize Trump Tower and the golf courses and everything. But what if you were actually right at the trial and you're, when your argument was these things are worth considerably less than Trump says they're worth? And Trump was, of course, inflating their value in order to fraudulently secure loans for himself uh, against the value of these properties, and he was lying about those properties. That's the problem with it. But now that you've established the fact that these things aren't worth nearly what Trump says they are, the next question is, are there enough things that you can take to equal $454 million in cash? And how do you make it work? You know, Theoretically, there's probably enough property out there under Trump organization ownership to seize and convert to cash. But how do you convert it to cash? Is there a buyer for Trump Tower? Is there a buyer for the Seven Springs estate? Probably the Seven Springs thing. Maybe Someone would buy Trump Tower. But then also, there were all sorts of other complications, like the weird ownership structures for some of these things. 40 Wall Street, another of the buildings that bears a Trump name, uh, it, it's totally misleading. But apparently, he doesn't own... The building, he doesn't own anything outright. He owns a, and remember, 40 Wall Street was, you know, the building that, if you recall, one of the dumber stories about Donald Trump uh, on 9 11, uh, somehow appearing on television somewhere to say that uh, now he, he owns the, uh, was it the second tallest building in Manhattan or something? And like, what, a totally inappropriate thing to have observed given the collapse of the World Trade Centers. But, and by the way, the World Trade Center, just so the headlines don't say, World Trade Center collapsed because buildings suck. They were hit by planes, like today with the bridge. Anyway, you know, there was an, somebody else acted here. Anyway, uh, they didn't find any difficulty in explaining that one, I don't think. But anyway, 40 Wall Street. He doesn't own the building. As it turns out, he, does, he owns 30% of a company that owns the ground lease on 40 Wall Street. And I don't know anything about that, but I read about it as they were describing the problem. The ground lease means you don't own the building, you don't own the land that the building is on, somebody else owns that. That's a fascinating fact. I'd love to know who owns it. Who's getting paid by Donald Trump and partners in order to sully the building with the Trump name. I'm not sure. But anyway, he owns 30% and 70% of the rest of the ground lease is owned by the Vornado partnership, which I think also is partners with Jared Kushner in 666 Fifth Avenue. Isn't that right? Anyway, a big uh, name in, in, in real estate that's somehow weirdly connected to massive fraud. Hmm. Just look something to look into. Um, so they together own the ground lease, which means somebody else owns the building. Somebody else, maybe entirely, a, a third or fourth party owns the land underneath. And everybody's essentially getting paid in order to grant the right to this partnership, Trump and Vornado, grant them the right to lease the rest of the building, to sublet portions of the building. So what they did is essentially they rented the building and then got permission for having paid the, the owners uh, to sublet the rest of the building. So they control the leases in the building 
for all the tenants, but they don't own the building. And, and, and Trump doesn't own it. He's only 30% of it. And so, okay, so can you seize that? Can you seize the 30%? Can you sell Trump's shares? It's not entirely clear. Apparently, the contract as between him and or, or the Trump organization, of course, and 18 layers of LLCs in between and Vornado may be that uh, neither of them can sell the shares without the permission of the other. So it's very difficult to know what you can liquidate and what you can't. And of course, all of the other properties he owns through various interlocking networks of of uh, <clears throat> shell companies and and the like. So anyway, even if he owned it outright, it would be like, well, you know, what can we get for Trump Tower? It might be that there's a fascination factor and somebody wants to pay lots of money for it. Maybe not. And if they liquidate all these things and they don't get enough money, what about that? So there's all sorts of problems with it and all sorts of headaches that, frankly, the state was probably hoping to avoid by forcing a bond, a cash bond instead. So anyway, back to what Andrew had written about. Does the state of New York need to have the full amount of the bond in order to make sure that the Trumps pay if they lose their appeal? And could the Trumps sell all their property and move it secretly like to a Swiss bank account and then abscond with it? No, is what's it's very difficult to liquidate all that stuff anyway. And then other protections against moving the money. For instance, during the trial, Judge Engeron appointed a special master. Remember that? Former Judge Barbara Jones, who was put in charge of overseeing all of the Trump businesses during the pendency of this trial. And then afterwards, after the judgment, he actually increased her powers of supervision over the Trump organization. Nothing can be done in those companies without her approval. They can't sell properties. They can't transfer assets out of state. They can't, as it says here, buy a spare roll of toilet paper without going through her. She has complete control of the vast bulk of their assets. There is no need for a bond, therefore, to protect the state. You can always just turn to judge, former judge Barbara Jones and say, you got to get us the money extracted from this organization. In addition to the attorney general's office, or in addition, the attorney general's office has also placed liens on several of their properties. That is going to effectively stop them from being sold or mortgaged, right? If you go to, if you, even if you decide you're going to liquidate the property and sell off Seven Springs and the Westchester Golf Course to satisfy the bond or the judgment, either one, uh, and you go to sell it, the buyer is going to look up the property records and see that there's a lien against it by the state of New York, and that's going to uh, worry them, and they're going to go through all sorts of additional legal expense to make sure that they are going to own the property free and clear when it's transferred to them. That might mean uh, paying the state of New York directly in the purchase deal, depending on how Trump works it out, or otherwise, even if Trump sells the thing for cash, he's got to make sure that the state gets its money. But the buyer also needs to make sure that that happens so that they can have title free and clear. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of reasons not to get into these transactions if you can avoid it. Anyway, the appellate court, Andrew uh, concludes here, did treat the Trumps differently than the average person. And that's true. They wouldn't have reduced my hypothetical $10,000 bond, but that is because the Trumps have already been treated differently by Engeron. He knew he was dealing with a cabal of crooked scumbags. That's true. And had put the protection in place in advance. If the full judgment holds up on appeal, the money will be there for the state to collect and they don't have to depend on the Trumps to do it. Barbara Jones can take care of that for them. Uh, being Having been granted legal control of the Trump organization by Judge Engeron. So... That's some relief and uh, also lots of writing out there today, although I didn't gather it up uh, to share with you. But people basically saying, you know, again, the size of the bond that they were looking for um, mm, wouldn't be absolutely necessary to collect all of it, given the fact that they have effective control over the Trump organization already through the special master's office. So uh, it's unlike anybody else, that's true, 
but also it's unlike anybody else because ordinarily there isn't a special master appointed to control your assets during the pendency of the trial. So, okay, that's definitely worth keeping in mind, I think. Other items uh, worth reviewing today, there are uh, there are several, and, and one related to that, the uh, SPAC uh, public offering of Digital World Acquisition Corporation and its merger with Trump Digital Media uh, did in fa- does in fact appear to be going through. There was uh, some speculation again that Trump might be able to, well, first of all, that there might be a $3 billion windfall in this operation for Trump and the Trump organization, and that might bail them out of the need for cash for the bond. But now, of course, there's something else has happened to bail them out of need for some 60% of the bond that they were originally going to have to pay. But in addition, there might be this additional income from the public offering of the merged companies, digital well. Uh, World Acquisition Corporation and Trump Digital Media. And, uh, but then there was some concern, I guess inside his organization, that they might not be able to, under the uh, agreement, to sell those shares for six months after the public offering so that that money wouldn't become immediately available and that it might not be acceptable for use as collateral for the bond. But apparently, these things, too, are subject to negotiations, and it may be that the other parties to the acquisition are fine with waiving the usual restriction and allowing Trump to sell those shares. Not certain that it's going to have to happen. And uh, also, you know, in disappointing news, I guess I grabbed this CNBC article with the headline that DWAC, Digital World Acquisition Company, stock jumps 35% yesterday on Trump's reduced bond. And some news on the uh, expected post-merger details of the story. They've uh, designated the the merged company will be operating under the stock ticker uh, name of, or, or, you know, abbreviation of DJT, which is, of course, Donald Trump's initials and just sort of insulting in general, but... There you have it. So key points in the bullet points here from Ryan Anastasio's piece for CNBC. Shares of Digital World Acquisition Corporation soared 35% after a court sharply reduced the bond that Trump has to pay to appeal a uh, the uh, uh, civil fraud ruling in New York. And the company will announce that it was changing its ticker designation, as I mentioned, to DJT. The Ruling came after uh, the approval of the merger, came after the approval of the merger between the shell company and the social media group owned by Trump. Shares in the merged company are set to begin publicly trading Tuesday, that's today, under the ticker symbol DJT. Uh, Hopefully, that's something, I think, hopefully, that's uh, something that uh, Murdery Trader Green will invest heavily in again and then lose heavily again. I think she lost like 80% of her investment the first time around with this thing. I don't know whether her fortunes rebounded yesterday with that news, but I don't think that's news that's going to last. Anyway, under the current terms of the deal, Trump will still not be allowed to sell shares in the company for at least six months. So they haven't worked out any sort of waiver about that just yet. Is there any more news about that and how that might change or if it can change? Let's take a look. Um Hmm. The DWAC jump on Monday was likely driven mostly by news of the reduced bond. Investors in the company initially feared that Trump might try to sell some of his majority stock in order to free up cash if he were required to post that bond. Maybe that's it, really. The jump, the 35% uh, jump was relief at not having to take a hit if Trump decided to dump a bunch of his stock. If he could get an agreement or he dumped the stock prior to the merger and IPO, then I guess it would be okay. Uh, But it would mean that most of the value of these shares for most people is, one, it's going to be a Trump company, 
But if Trump is, you know, very publicly dumping all of his shares, anybody dumps that many shares, the value is going to go down, of course, because then there's a glut in the market of these shares. But on top of that, if it is paired with the news that Trump is no longer really going to be heavily associated with this company because he's desperate for cash, then the people who are buying essentially souvenir stocks in Donald Trump would lose all the value of their investment anyway. Not that there was any to begin with. Anyway, but with the bond reduced the odds that Trump would try to sell his shares right uh fell significantly so the shareholders in the uh, SPAC voted on Friday to approve the combination between their SPAC and Trump Media and Technology Group uh which owns Truth Social shares in the merged company will begin publicly trading on Tuesday under that DJT ticker symbol the company's debut on public markets could provide that financial boost to Trump, who is expected to own 80 million shares, which could be worth around $3 billion or more in the new company, even though, honestly, the company's probably worth zero. Uh, under the deal's current terms, Trump can't sell those shares for at least six months. However, the board of directors could vote to permit Trump to sell shares earlier. The board is expected to include several people close to Trump, for that reason, I would add, including his son, Donald Trump Jr., and Trump's former trade representative, uh, Robert Lighthizer. A potential windfall from selling the shares could help pay legal bills and damage judgments, uh, which he's got piling up, of course. And then, let's see, Monday's rise comes after the stock fell nearly 14% on Friday, previous week, after DWAC shareholders signed off on the merger. That's interesting. So we're, we're going to have the merger. We're going to have an IPO next week. And that news hits the stock for a 14% drop, which tells you that, you know, look, there's no value to this company. The stock had uh, soared 160% this year, but lost all but about 15% of that since hitting its 52-week high on January 23rd. So it's been a while and a long downslide for the stock. So we'll keep an eye on it, I guess, and we'll see uh, whether or not they engineer this windfall for Trump. But it's not great news. That's certainly true. All right, let's see. Um... There's, uh, well, you know, I guess at this point we don't really need to read the Washington Post story that I tucked away explaining the, well, it might explain some of the details of the change in the bond that would be helpful. Uh, all right, we'll zip through some of that and uh, hit some other news and uh, then set ourselves up for a discussion with Joan. Uh, this Mark Berman, Jonathan O'Connell, and Shana Jacobs teamed up on to explain things. Trump wins Partial stay, we're going to get into the nitty gritty here, I guess, partial stay of the fraud judgment and is allowed to post $175 million instead of 454 Trump previously faced a requirement to post that half a billion dollar bond to stop the New York Attorney General from taking his assets. Again, it's not a ticket to the appeals court. It's just a ticket to freeze the assets in place under your own ownership and not immediately start having to pony up to pay the judgment from the trial court, right? An appeals court panel in New York said Monday that former President Donald Trump should be would be allowed to post a $175 million bond to stave off enforcement of a nearly half billion dollar civil judgment against him and his business. The order was a significant win for Trump, who was otherwise facing a massive cash crunch and still is. I mean, $175 million is not nothing. And the prospect of New York Attorney General Letitia James moving to seize some of his assets as soon as this week. However, while the five state judges on the panel, it's a five-judge panel, not three, like in the federal courts, eased the financial strain on Trump, they did not erase it entirely. They gave Trump 10 days to come up with the reduced bond of $175 million, saying they would only delay enforcement to the full amount if... He put up that lower figure within this window, and it's not immediately clear how he will come up with that money. We'll put up the bond or the cash very quickly, Trump told reporters on Monday, but provided no specifics, of course. Not that he was really obligated to, but with him, you always want to know. Trump's attorneys had previously sought to post a $100 million bond. That's what they asked for uh, in their first motion, and they were 
told no, but now they're being told, well, 175 would be okay, apparently. The panel's order came at a precarious moment for Trump, who was contending with significant financial pressure and legal peril. The appeals panel's order came down while he was in a New York court in a bid to delay the start of his criminal case related to the hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. The justice rejected that effort and said the case will go to trial on April 15th, tax day. The ruling put the first ever criminal trial of a former president back on track after the judge had ordered a brief delay to consider a claim from Trump that prosecutors had engaged in misconduct. They didn't. And by the way, the judge was apparently very angry about that and said, listen, you can't just keep claiming that there's prosecutorial misconduct every time. Well, you know, every time you open your mouth, uh, you got to prove this stuff if you're going to say it. And if you can't just blurt it out or your things are going to go poorly for you in court, let's say. Trump faces 34 charges of falsifying business records as he sought to hide payments to adult film actress Stormy Daniels. Separately, Trump has also been ordered by two civil juries to pay nearly $90 million to E. Jean Carroll and, of course, faces four criminal charges, including the hush money case in New York. The civil fraud judgment against Trump stems from the lawsuit that Letitia James brought against him and his company. And by the way, over the weekend, some interesting articles pointing out that AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, deserves the, uh, a huge amount of the credit for pushing this case by uh, pointing out in her questioning of Michael Cohen when he appeared before Congress that, uh, well, did he, asking the pointed questions, did Trump inflate the value of his properties in order to secure loans from banks? Yes, was the answer. And, you know, isn't that fraudulent? Yes, said Michael Cohen. And apparently that was enough to get the uh, attention of authorities refocused and saying, you know, we might be able to, uh, you know, get some recompense for this if we bring this case. So uh, kudos once again to AOC. Back to the article, though, New York Supreme Court Justice Arthur Engeron, who heard the case in February issued a written decision that assailed Trump and other defendants saying they showed a staggering lack of contrition and remorse, ordered that hefty judgment, and with interest it comes out to more than $450 million. He, Trump, immediately vowed to appeal that ruling, but in order to stop Letitia James, the AG, from collecting in the meantime, that's why he would be required to put up a bond for the full amount. Trump's attorney said he couldn't finance the appeal bond, uh, at that level, they said his team had contacted 30 companies, none of which would take the real estate, which accounts for most of Trump's wealth as collateral. Instead, they required he put up cash or investment accounts, and that seemed to be impossible. The appeals court on Monday did not reduce the initial judgment. That is to say, he still owes $450 million plus. Only the amount that Trump needs to put up for a bond while appealing is reduced. His deadline for securing the bond is next Thursday, April 4th. The extra 10 days may not be enough of an extension for Trump to turn his real estate into cash, and it typically takes weeks or months to sell properties such as golf courses or hotels, unless you're, of course, selling them to Russian mobsters, in which case it's all easy. Asked on Monday by reporters how he would pay, uh, no answer, of course, and... Uh, you weren't likely to get one from him. Exactly how much cash Trump has uh, and securities that he could use, difficult to determine. As of April of last year, he claimed to have 400 plus million dollars during a deposition in the fraud case. In August, a financial disclosure filed with the Office of Government Ethics lists hundreds of banks and bank and investment accounts with a total value of between 252 and $924 million. It's a very wide range, once again, that you're uh, afforded. Since then, there have been some meaningful changes to his finances. Earlier this month, he posted a $91 million bond to delay enforcement of a judgment in the defamation, one of the defamation cases that he lost to Carroll. Um, then, of course, there's the truth social thing, which might be the $3 billion windfall if he's allowed to sell his uh, shares. And, of course, $3 billion is 
the total value of all of his shares. And if he sells all of those, I don't know that they're going to get $3 billion out of that. If you just like uh, the day after the IPO dump 80 million shares of this stuff on the market, I don't know that $3 billion is the haul. Anyway, uh, asked Monday whether he would accept assistance from a foreign government. Trump said, I don't do that. <laughs> but he does, of course, and that's the problem. He then added, I think he'd be allowed to, possibly. I don't know. It's the sort of thing he should know by now. The biggest banks, frankly, are outside of the country. So you could do that, but I don't need to borrow money. <laughs> I just uh, spent the whole month in court saying, I need to borrow money. And now, of course, he says, I don't need to. Foreign governments spent millions of dollars at Trump properties while he was president, they helpfully point out. Uh, that's certainly true. According to a January report from House Democrats, Trump's company, by the way, donated some of the revenue to the U.S. Treasury, some, but has said the transactions were for market rates. They likely were not. Trump has long used his legal jeopardy to rally supporters, arguing that he is being politically targeted. Polling showed that after he was indicted last year, his support among Republicans increased. And even though Monday's appeals court ruling boiled down to an order that he must find $175 million to put up, he hailed it as a victory over Engeron and James, claiming in a social media post that he, the ruling shattered their credibility. Though, of course, it really didn't. Uh, there's some uh, a statement from James's office. Donald Trump is still facing accountability for his staggering fraud. The court has already found that he engaged in years of fraud to falsely inflate his net worth and unjustly enrich himself, his family, and his organization. The $464 million judgment, plus interest, it's gone up $10 million, I guess, against Trump and the other defendants still stands. So, again, it's not the case that his fines or that his uh, penalties have been reduced uh, that still stands it's just the amount he's putting up in order to secure uh, payment pending appeal all right time for yet another break so we've gotten through at least that got clarified I think and uh, now we got a couple of other developments we really have to spend some time on um, well, uh, international news, domestic news, things we didn't discuss yesterday that we should have. Uh, you know, this wasn't really the things I wanted to spend a great deal of time on not necessarily, but uh, we didn't mention, we didn't discuss with Greg yesterday, the Rona McDaniel deal with NBC. That definitely needs to be put on the record. Then we got some other long reads to poke through. I don't know. We probably won't even get to that. We got more news to recap. We'll do that after this. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Breaking news! Uh, sorry, everybody, I broke it. And uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do to put it back together again. But breaking news in, in, I don't know, we'll make it COVID news. Not really, but uh, Joan can't make it. She doesn't have COVID. Everybody relax. Joan won't be in today. She got a recent COVID booster, and you know how that can be. And uh, so, in in effect, uh, to to stave off the disaster that has befallen us with Greg contracting COVID at this late date, we're making sure that it doesn't happen again. We're doing our best to reduce the effects should it happen in the future with Joan McCarter. So, okay, uh, we'll miss her. But as we know, uh, this was a good time to do it, right? You schedule the COVID booster after they secure a CR that uh, uh, sews things up for the rest of the or In fact, a minibus uh, 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 spending bill, not a CR, but taking us all the way through the end of the fiscal year. So go ahead and get that protection taken care of. And uh, hopefully quick recovery from the side effects of getting the booster. It does happen. And uh, we'll miss you. But and then, So now we're, I guess, free to discuss the other procedural questions still pending. One of the things, for instance, that I thought we might discuss, but which we might as well treat as a headline to catch up on. I happened to see this one yesterday at the AP. Republicans threatened to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt over Biden documents case. Uh, does this bring back memories for all of you about contempt of Congress and the various uh, the side issues that are wrapped up in it? If not, 
or if you're new-ish to the show, uh, then I will go over the uh, details with you. Here it is. Uh, let's see. Farnoosh Amiri is the reporter for AP on this one. House Republicans threatened to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress if he did not turn over unredacted materials related to the special counsel probe into Biden's handling of classified documents. You'll recall that, oh, I don't know, like five seconds ago, not really, I mean, some time ago at this point, um, Robert Hur's report was issued, and as much as he tried to make a issue about something else about Biden, the ultimate import of his report was, eh, the upshot was, we're, we're just not going to charge Biden here. It's materially different from what Trump did. Uh, to the extent it was found that he was in retention of some documents that belong to the Archives and Records Administration, he immediately moved to return them. Was there classified material? Yes, there was. Was he willing to return it when asked? Yes, he was. That's the quantum difference with the Trump case. He denied he had the things. He denied that they were classified. He insisted he had the right to retain them. He did try to retain them. They had to go past request to subpoena and past subpoena to search warrant in order to get those things back. Nowhere in that neighborhood with Biden. And of course, you know, several other reasons along the way uh, some more controversial than others in the way that her handled them. But uh, essentially the conclusion, no need for prosecution here. Um, as proof, here's a report. The report contains some redactions and Republicans, whenever they see redactions, the set play, as you say, I demand the unredacted documents, even if there's really good reason for those redactions. It doesn't really matter. Give us the unredacted documents or we'll hold you in contempt of Congress. Ah, but can they? Let's discuss. In a letter Monday obtained by the Associated Press representatives James Comer and Jim Jordan, believe it or not, worst track record in history on things like this, still flapping their gums nonetheless, or at least flapping this uh, paper on which they had printed their letter. Uh, they demanded that Garland comply with their subpoena. And the two Republican chairmen sent last month as part of their emerging investigation into special counsel Robert Hur's decision not to charge the president. So in other words, we accused the president of having, or someone else accused the president of having these materials. He returned them. Well, we want a special counsel to decide whether or not he should be brought up on charges, considering that Trump was just brought up on charges. Okay, fine. There's a huge difference between the two cases, but fine. Special counsel, investigate. And in fact, we'll avoid all these problems by in investigating uh, or, or assigning a Republican to the job, as we always do with special counsels. Because as you know, if a Republican is being investigated, it's only fair to have a Republican do the investigating. And if a Democrat is charged with something, it's only fair to have a Republican do the investigating. Because only Republicans will be trusted by Republicans, and then we won't have this backlash, and we won't go through the hand-wringing and garment-rendering and gnashing of teeth as they demand that the investigation be investigated because you can trust a Republican to do the investigation correctly. That's why we assigned the Republican to do it in the first place. Oh, what? That didn't matter? Nope, it didn't matter. Republican uh, and something of a Republican uh, hitman at that conducts the investigation and decides, nope, there's not going to be any prosecution here. Nonetheless... Republicans are demanding an investigation of the investigation now. And if we don't get your cooperation, Merrick Garland, in an investigation of the investigation, then we're going to investigate you and hold you in contempt of Congress. Comer, the chair of the Oversight Committee, and Jordan, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, which is a joke in itself, ordered the Justice Department to turn over the unredacted audio and transcripts of hers hours-long interviews with Biden and his ghostwriter, by April 8th, if you fail to do so, the committees will consider taking further action. Hmm, we'll consider it. Such as the invocation of contempt of Congress proceedings, the two lawmakers wrote. Now, on the one hand, they they can demand these things. 
And if they subpoena them and the subpoenas are not complied with, that is their recourse. But there are complications. The Justice Department, of course, reacted to the letter late Monday saying the department has been extraordinarily transparent with Congress throughout the process. It's something you say even if it's not true, but in this case, I guess it maybe has been. The Attorney General released Mr. Hur's report to Congress and made no redactions or changes. The department provided documents to Congress, including a copy of the president's interview transcript. And Mr. Hur testified before Congress for more than five hours about his investigation. Emma Delaney, department spokesperson, said in a statement to AP, given the department's ongoing and extensive cooperation, we hope they will reconsider this unnecessary escalation. Well, no, they didn't consider it in the first place. The Threat is just the latest tension point between Republicans and the GOP-appointed federal prosecutor who appeared before lawmakers two weeks ago for more than a four-hour interrogation, they said five, surrounding his 345-page report that questioned Biden's age and mental competence. It really didn't. It just said that we think that he would pretend it was in question in order to get off the hook. Um, let's see. Uh, and yes, by the way, the statement did say that the testimony was for more than five hours, and now the AP credits them only with more than four hours. So I don't know who's right on that one. Um, anyway, uh, this all, the four hours surrounding this whole uh, report, and then ultimately recommending no criminal charges. Her said that he found insufficient evidence to make a case that would stand up in court. What I wrote is what I believe the evidence shows and what I expect jurors would perceive and believe. I did not sanitize my explanation, nor did I disparage the president unfairly, he says. Despite his defense, her faced an onslaught of criticism from both sides of the aisle. So he must be doing something right for the commentary in his report and the decision to withhold pressing charges against Biden. Hours before his testimony, the Justice Department released a redacted transcript that provided a more nuanced picture of the roughly hour long, I'm sorry, <laughs> hour long, hour long interview, maybe, but year long investigation, filling in some of the gaps left by hers and Biden's accounting of the exchanges. Republicans, including Comer and Jordan, have insisted for the past year that unlike Biden, the former, uh, former President Donald Trump has been treated unfairly in his, by his own Justice Department, somehow, for mishandling classified documents. During the hearing, GOP members reiterated that while Biden was let off the hook, Trump has been singled out and vilified, questioning if the facts of the two cases were all that different. Well, they were, but not according to Tom McClintock, Republican of California, who called it a glaring double standard. Trump's being prosecuted for exactly the same act that you documented Joe Biden committed. No, he was not. However, they point out, helpfully, there are major differences between the two probes. Biden's team returned the documents after they were discovered, and the president cooperated with the investigation by voluntarily sitting for an interview and consenting to searches of his homes. Trump, by contrast, is accused of enlisting the help of aides and lawyers to conceal the documents from the government and seeking to have potentially incriminating evidence destroyed. And that's only one of several major differences, but that's the one that's listed here. So... What's the story? Reminder for those of you who may have forgotten or may not have been around during the heyday of, uh, well, I don't know, was it, Con was it a Congress Matters issue or was it just something that I covered for Daily Coast? Uh, but it came up again recently when I was talking about the Ringwiss profile uh, and his mention of how often it turns out that members of Congress don't actually know the rules of the institution or the... the uh, uh, rules surrounding the institution as well. Um, uh, and in that case, I was talking about uh, longtime oversight committee chairman, Henry Waxman, former congressman uh, who was uh, at the head of that committee. And uh, let's see, he was also the head of the energy and commerce panel for a while as well. But as chair of the house oversight committee, um, it should have been, background knowledge for him how contempt of congress works and what the options were but you know it's still a relatively rare thing to uh to issue contempt of congress charges you know most people comply when they're asked by congress or subpoenaed by congress but 
he ran into uh, opposition in the George W. Bush administration early on with their unwillingness to comply because they, I guess they knew the uh, loopholes that they could hide in. But just we'll, uh, we'll get straight to the point here. Comer and Jordan think they want to bring contempt of Congress charges against Biden, against Biden administration officials, in this case, uh, Merrick Garland. Um, and I guess they think they want to do it partially in retaliation. And remember, we were told all those years when it was possible that Democrats might do something in return, uh, even when well justified against Republicans. Well, that's tit for tat, right? You're going to, people are talking about impeaching George W. Bush. That's just retaliation for the Clinton impeachment. No, it stood on its own, but it did follow the other one in time. And so therefore it was tit for tat. Well, here clearly a tit for tat game going on. You have just uh, won and imprisoned, um, what's his name? Uh, gosh, uh, Navarro, I already forget his name, uh, on contempt of Congress charges. You have a conviction against Steve Bannon, although he hasn't yet begun serving his sentence for contempt of Congress. Why not? Uh, we'll get some Democrats on this one. In this case, Merrick Garland. Well, here's the issue. How does contempt of Congress work? Henry Waxman knew some of it, but not all of it. Uh, and here's the deal. The basically comes down to this. Congress has, well, two ways of making people pay for uh, contempt charges against it. The far more common and current practice is to uh, issue a subpoena, the subpoena gets uh, defied, and then you bring contempt, you refer contempt of Congress charges. Uh, it goes to the House floor. You know, Republicans, I guess, assume that they can win this vote. That's not always a good assumption and they may not have a majority to do so. So it might be a dead letter right there. Uh, you know, an unjust flexing, undue flex for Comer and Jordan, who may not be able to muster a majority to pass contempt of Congress resolutions on the House floor. And then two, it gets referred to who under the statutory contempt of Congress regime under which Navarro was convicted, the statute under which Bannon was convicted. You have to get the Justice Department to bring contempt of Congress charges, statutory charges in court. You have a trial, etc., etc. Uh the big issue, and this first arose during the George W. Bush administration, where one of the people who should have been brought up on contempt of Congress charges was Bush's own then Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez, for various reasons, faced similar charges. And they helpfully pointed out at the time that what this means is you have to depend on the Department of Justice to bring charges against the contemnor, in this case, the Attorney General of the United States. So there's some chance that, let's say, uh, the Department of Justice may decline to see the merit in bringing contempt of Congress charges against their boss, the Attorney General. What ends up happening is Congress refers the contempt charges. Usually it's not against a executive department official. Usually, on top of that, it's, it's very frequently not against a Department of Justice official. It's usually against outsiders, civilians, third parties, and you depend on the Department of Justice to defend the prerogatives of the legislative branch by bringing those charges. But here you're looking for the prerogatives of the legislative branch to be enforced by the executive branch against itself. And in this case, specifically against itself, the Department of, of Justice bringing charges against the attorney general. What's the likelihood that the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, who usually is the one who receives the referral to bring these charges uh, for contempt of Congress. What are the odds that he says, uh, he or she, I don't even know who the D.C. Attorney, uh, U.S. attorney is, says, 
it's for whatever reason substantively true or not that it is a a bad idea to try to bring contempt of Congress charges against my boss, the Attorney General. Now, is that undue influence? Should the Department of Justice, in fact, be dedicated to the pursuit of justice no matter who is being targeted here? Yes, absolutely. So, I don't know. This is actually kind of good. I think I like this. Good. Bring contempt, refer contempt of Congress charges to the Justice Department. Let's see if Merrick Garland, in an abundance of caution and fairness, decides to direct the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia to bring him up on charges of contempt of Congress such that he would stand trial. Let's see if it happens. And of course, the usual prediction here is no, it won't happen. One, they don't really have a case. I mean, I guess he did. He Well, he hasn't yet been issued the subpoenas and he hasn't yet defied the subpoenas. And in most cases, the courts say, uh, Let's have you go through a period of negotiation to try to work out a solution rather than have us be the ones to step in and impose a solution. It usually takes an awfully long time. And the people from who, who remember the charges against uh, figures in the George W. Bush administration will recall that they were able to stretch things out long enough such that the contempt charges never reached the court during the tenure of the Bush administration. We were already into the Obama administration by the time that came around, and the whole thing was more or less moot at that point. Will they be able to stretch this uh, beyond the Biden administration, whether just one or two of them? may not matter. I don't know. But uh, those of you who were uh, sharp of ear during the discussion of the Ringwiss article the other day will remember that the main point that Henry Waxman didn't know about was that there is and always was an additional approach to available for contempt of Congress. If you run into the problem of we need to prosecute uh, executive branch members and the unitary executive remember that concept from the bush administration the unitary executive uh declines to bring charges even if against the, a contemner who's not the attorney general let's say it's the head of the epa for instance just to pick a figure out of a hat for no apparent reason and of course if you know the history here you know what i'm doing if not i'll tell you in a minute but let's say the head, the administrator of the EPA refuses to comply with a subpoena, a congressional subpoena. Will the unitary executive bring charges against itself? Never mind having to do it against the attorney general, for which you wouldn't have to resort to weird concepts like the unitary executive. You could just say, well, this is the same person. It's not a conceptual unity. It's an actual unity. But uh, would a... Uh, executive branch DOJ bring charges against an executive branch EPA administrator for defying a subpoena from Congress. Uh, always doubtful in a Republican administration, maybe also doubtful in a Democratic administration, for all I know. And the courts don't like dealing with it. They don't like having to deal with this weirdness. And they say you really need to work something out. The history is there's lots of contention always historically between the legislative branch and the executive branch. Work it out. Don't make the judicial branch step in and say which one of these other two co-equal branches is supposed to be superior here. Work it out. Well, sometimes that's not a satisfactory answer for Congress, and Congress occasionally remembers that it is a co-equal branch, and it shouldn't have to depend on the judicial branch to ad to defend its interests against the executive branch. So what happens when a co-equal branch demands information from a co-equal branch? Uh, should it have to resort to a yet another co-equal branch for the ability to enforce its subpoenas? And the answer, historically, constitutionally, is no. There is another mechanism called inherent contempt. Why is there even a thing called inherent contempt? And what mean, what, what mean you by inherent? What's inherent about this contempt? And the answer is, uh, look, if Congress has the right to issue subpoenas and to see them enforced, 
It shouldn't have to depend on another branch to enforce it against a third branch or for a third branch to enforce it against a second or however you want to view this thing. It should be as a matter of inherent powers, the Congress is able to subpoena and if they don't get satisfaction, they should be able to hold you in contempt directly and jail you directly because it is a co-equal power with these other two branches. There shouldn't have to be a reliance on statutory contempt of Congress. But, for the most part, contempt charges were brought against outside parties, not other parties to co-equal branch status in the government, and they found it was uh, a cleaner and more modern practice to simply say the DOJ will prosecute Mm, let's say, uh, corporate executives who refuse our subpoenas. That was easier uh, to understand as a DOJ prosecution. But when you're prosecuting the DOJ itself, inherent powers. Now, they hadn't been used for almost 100 years at the time that they were first hinted at during the George, last, I guess, hinted at during the George W. Bush administration. And so it was possible to forgive uh, Henry Waxman for not knowing, even though honestly, at some point, you know, pick up a CRS report and ask yourself, what do we do if the executive branch won't help us bring other executive branch members to heal for a genuine and valid congressional subpoena? I mentioned to you that what if the situation was the EPA administrator? The reason I bring that up, if you don't know, is that the first time that this really came to a head and executive branch officials were simply flatly going to refuse to comply with the congressional subpoena and they had to address the question of who will prosecute a member of the executive branch. Will it be another member of the executive branch from the DOJ or does Congress have to do it itself? The first time that happened, the first time they couldn't work out a deal apparently, though they later did, was as against... Uh, Congress's demands for compliance with the subpoena from EPA administrator in the Reagan administration, Ann Gorsuch. Yes, you knew this was the wind up if you know the history. If you don't, you'd be surprised and you'll say to yourself, Ann Gorsuch, is she any relation to Neil Gorsuch, who now sits on the Supreme Court and would be called upon to decide such an issue uh, and settle the uh, contest between the immovable object of the EPA, executive branch EPA, and the irresistible force of co-equal branch Congress in issuing its own subpoenas, which it has a constitutional right to do, according to, you know, the Supreme Court. Are they related? Yes, of course they're related. Neil Gorsuch's mother was Ann Gorsuch. That's right. And now there's somebody who has institutional memory of yeah, this is all BS when Democrats want to get compliance from out of a Republican government. But what do we do when Republicans want to get compliance from out of a Democratic government? How are we going to reconcile that? It would require monumental unfairness and double standards. Who's got that? Well, what if we put the Gorsuch kid on the Supreme Court? And then next time it came up, if we need somebody who could be that ridiculous with their double standards... We would find such a person because he has visceral memories of his mother being victimized and all of this by bad, bad Democrats. Uh, only he would be capable of tying himself into the sorts of knots that would be necessary to enforce this as against Democrats, but not as against Republicans. But luckily, he's already on the Supreme Court and should be fine. So there you go. Just uh, if and if you're into dynastic politics or against dynastic politics, for instance, uh, don't forget the Gorsuch clan in the middle of all this. All right. So there you have it. Uh, but very shortly, they may run into this. This will be real interesting as Republicans in Congress claim for the first time to become aware of this odd situation, which makes it extraordinarily difficult at the from the outset for the Congress to force the Democratic, well, Republican Congress to force a Democratic DOJ to prosecute its own boss. But then again, it also wouldn't be a problem 
Uh, well, if Republicans controlled Congress and there was a Republican administration, they would simply understand that inherently they didn't have the power to do this because the very, very strong Republican president would tell them that they don't. But when a very, very corrupt, bad, bad guy, because he's a Democrat, uh, runs the uh, executive branch, that's obvious corruption. But they'll learn that shortly enough. Whether or not they know about inherent contempt, I don't know. Whether or not they even have the votes to do statutory contempt is very much in doubt. But there you have it. All of the uh, complexities laid out for you. And, uh, well... It's all out there on the record. All they had to do was ask CRS about the decide. Whether or not they've ever done it, I don't know. I don't think that's the sort of homework that Comer or Jordan is capable of doing. But uh, somebody somewhere will probably dig up inherent contempt for them. And then we'll uh, see how it plays out. But uh, like I said, they probably wouldn't even get the votes for statutory contempt, much less inherent contempt. But uh, it'll be fun. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad! Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't do it without you hope you'll be on board soon too thanks for all your support all right welcome back now to the k in the morning show here on netroots radio and uh let's see i'm just sort of uh working through the uh the thinking about the conclusion and uh letting people know via Blue sky. I guess we'll we'll find out whether anyone has read anything about inherent contempt on the Republican side. They have an opportunity to uh, inflame that into something uh, dumb and fruitless, which is to say that they would then move immediately for inherent contempt charges against Merrick Garland. Uh, that would be an ultimate lesson in of sorts for Merrick Garland, although I don't know I don't know what he would learn from that. What do you think we, would be the takeaway for Merrick Garland, having bent over backwards this whole time to cross every T, dot every I, uh, be as open as possible, and build what he thinks is bulletproof approaches to working, you know, to, to dealing with Republicans, to handling investigations. If he were to have bent over backwards, appointed Robert Herr as special counsel, he issues his report, they have hearings, they question him, etc. If he's met with an insistence from uh, from uh, um, Republicans in Congress, uh, Jordan, Comey, etc., Com- oh, dang, already uh, losing track of, of who's who here. Uh, I've always been confused on the fly as between Comer and Comey, but of course, at any rate, uh, it would be how, how fascinating for him to have that, what he thinks of as good faith, be met with an inherent contempt finding and an, I guess an attempt to send Capitol Police and the sergeant at arms of the House to arrest Merrick Garland and imprison him. Somewhere 
Uh, and remember that Congress no longer maintains, if they ever maintained, it's highly questionable whether they ever maintain an actual jail cell somewhere under their control. Uh, they, they, there's still facilities available to them, but they've never had to lock up a DOJ official in any of them. And presumably all of those things are all the, all the prisons available to the Capitol police. I think they, the Capitol Police, when they detain people, just use the D.C. city jail to, to put them in. And I guess that's different from putting them into a federally controlled facility. Would you, would you be able to put Merrick Garland in a Bureau of Prisons controlled facility? Uh, ordinarily, you say, well, I, if the question is, can you put a, even a Democratic Attorney General who would bend over backwards to be totally fair. You can't, you'll never get a Republican Attorney General to agree to this. They'll just know from the outset, right? A Democratic Attorney General would say, well, in the interest of fairness, justice, truth, justice in the American way, particularly Merrick Garland. Even a, a, another Democrat would say, well, but no, I'm not going to imprison myself. <laughs> Merrick Garland, well, to be fair, I really should put myself in prison. I don't know. I don't know. But it'll be exciting to watch. Don't you think? Uh, if only because it will be like, hey, Merrick, wake the hell up. What do you think? Who do you think you're dealing with here? Um, would that uh, is there is there a, a point at which even Merrick Garland says these guys might not be fair? I don't know. what uh, They're very, very, very wrong about this. And I'm just going to have to show them how wrong it is. Uh not by locking myself up, but by not being locked up. It's it's a a crystalline case, as I sometimes like to say about various things. Uh, often I'm wrong about them, but in this case, yes, uh, maybe. All right. Wow. So that's of interest. Uh, by the way, other things of interest, I guess, that we might want to talk about. A piece from The Guardian also being picked up by other outlets now because it's so weird and outrageous, speaking of, uh, oh, I don't know, corrupt figures in the government. The next, Clarence Thomas. Do we have another Clarence Thomas in the offering? That's a gets the Fox question mark there in The Guardian. The, f the next, Clarence Thomas. Abortion pill case spotlights right-wing judge and his wife's shadowy connections. Can't believe there's another judicial wife with shadowy connections. Melissa Segura reports this for The Guardian. The subheader tells us who we're talking about. Judge James Ho, H-O, Ho, Ho, uh, ruled to restrict Mifepristone, but it also turns out that his wife, Allison, is linked to the anti-abortion group that brought the case. Wow, that seems odd and bad and should never have happened and yet did. And wow, it happened in favor of Republicans. I can't believe it. When the former... President Donald Trump appointed the, and this is the Guardian here, so they have to say the former President Donald Trump, as opposed to in English here in America, we would say when former President Donald Trump appointed the Texas Attorney General, I'm sorry, attorney, not the Attorney General, but the Texas Attorney James Ho to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in 2017. And it might well have been the Texas Attorney General that he had placed there, but Ken Paxton was busy doing his own dirty work at the time and didn't want to have anything to do with it. Okay, so James Ho ended up where? Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, the most conservative, corrupt, upside down, backwards, and will do anything for Donald Trump type of uh, of circuit court. That happened in 2017. Lawyers at the prominent law firm of Gibson Dunn, where Ho worked before his appointment, had a problem. They thought they had a problem. Anyway, how to replace the politically connected Ho? Well, it turns out <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way of putting it. All right. You knew the joke was coming. The guy's last name is Ho. Ha ha. Very funny. Ho. Slang term, etc. But how to replace the politically connected Ho? How will we protect, replace that Ho? I don't know. We got to get another Ho who can hustle just as hard. I guess so. That, it turns out, they didn't even need to change the home address for his replacement because Ho's wife, Allison, who every day has to live with the fact that she's married a man named Ho and had to adopt the surname of Ho, 
Uh, well, Allison moved into her husband's position and his old office because, you know, she's a lawyer too. And then, of course, they had to take advantage of the opportunity and say, meet the hoes. All right, there it is. Few people outside of legal circles have heard of the hoes. Yet the couple is tied to the case before the U.S. Supreme Court that will determine women's access to mifepristone, a drug commonly used in medication abortions. The court hears arguments in the case on Tuesday. That's today. Ho served on the three-judge panel last summer that ruled to restrict access to mifepristone. The legal group behind that case, Alliance Defending Freedom, you've heard their name all the time, has made at least six payments between 2018 and 2022 to Ho's wife, Allison, a powerhouse federal appellate lawyer who has argued in front of the Supreme Court and has deep connections to the conservative legal movement that has led the attack on the right to abortion in the U.S. The payments don't violate, believe it or not, the court's code of conduct, according to Stephen Gillers, a New York University emeritus professor of law and author of Regulation of Lawyers, Problems of Law and Ethics. He wrote the textbook, ladies and gentlemen, but some court watchers argue that Ho's failure to recuse himself from the case illustrates why public trust in the judiciary is eroding, one recent survey found that 63% of judges noted a dip in the public's positive perception of them. That is a weird survey. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not saying that 63% of the public doesn't trust the judiciary. I don't know what the results of the survey were. They may even be higher than that, but note that the 63% here is judges own reporting of their understanding of a public dip in positive perceptions of the judiciary. That's a narrow slice of the situation there. But anyway, as they were saying, it's apparently not against the court's code of conduct for the Alliance Defending Freedom to pay Judge Ho's wife, Allison, to do this advocacy for them. But it is highly questionable that Ho would not have recused himself from the panel. You know, what did we, there's like a dozen, 20, I don't know how many judges on the Fifth Circuit. If he randomly gets named to the panel and his wife's, uh, well, one of the one of the clients who pays his wife is one of the parties to the case they're hearing, it's pretty easy to find a replacement. But just, and this, I guess, is what invites this among the fact that that plus her activity in conservative causes is what invites the comparison to Clarence Thomas. That and the fact that Clarence Thomas didn't recuse himself when there were cases that involved Ginny and Judge Ho doesn't recuse himself when there are cases involving Allison. When Americans see a case like this, so clearly concocted and motivated by special interests and with evident connections between those interests and the judges on the case, it does tremendous damage to the reputation of the courts and to the public trust in their ability to give all litigants an even shake, said Alex Aronson, the executive director of the nonpartisan group Court Accountability and former chief counsel to the Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, in an email to The Guardian, James Ho wrote that he, quote, consulted our court's ethics advisor prior to sitting in that case and was advised that there was no basis for recusal. In any event, my wife's practice is to donate honoraria to charity. That doesn't actually matter in terms of bias for the outcome, but, you know, he says the ethics advisor, the ethics advisor of the Fifth Circuit told him, eh, you don't need to recuse. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Alexa, you tell me. The hoes are just one of the increasing number of power couples in the conservative movement in which the wife of a prominent official works in the background, laying the groundwork for, public, for Republican policies that their spouses will rule upon or legislate. In the Mifepristone case, the wife of Missouri Senator Josh Hawley, Aaron, is the attorney of record for the Alliance Defending Freedom, and argued the case before Ho. The Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas rankled the legal world, remember this? 
Does anybody remember this? I don't know. When he refused to recuse himself from a case involving questions about the January 6th insurrection and the Stop the Steal campaign to which his wife, Ginny, was closely tied. For Aronson... These are examples of serious concerns about what is becoming an apparent pattern of coordinated activity by some of these couples in this extremist movement, including the Thomases, Hawleys, and Hoes. They're all Hoes, in my view. Hoes rulings have included zealous language, referencing what he called in one decision the moral tragedy of abortion. He has suggested that protection orders in domestic violence cases are too often misused as a tactical device in divorce proceedings and issued without any actual threat of danger. Oh, my. Orrin Kerr, a University of California Berkeley law professor, tweeted that one of Ho's opinions, quote, reads like a politician's op-ed, not a legal opinion. Judges should stick to law. Just shut up and play, right? Call balls and strikes. If the or in the myth of Pristone case in which Ho supported rolling back decisions made by the FDA to loosen restrictions on the drug, he wrote, unborn babies are a source of profound joy for those who view them. This is so innocent bystanders are being harmed by myth of Pristone, you see. Expectant parents eagerly share ultrasound photos with loved ones. So what? Friends and family cheer at the sight of an unborn child, which is actually the sight of a mother, but okay. Doctors delight in working with their unborn patients and experience an aesthetic injury when they are aborted. That's that's like a real thing that a judge said. Aesthetic injury. I, you, I love seeing pregnant women. It means such joyful stuff. When they abort their babies, less joy. Now, when they have miscarriages, less joy, but who do we prosecute for that? I don't know. I mean, they're working out ways to figure it out. How can we prosecute women for that? You're making it difficult for me to view things that give me joy. You have to go to prison. That's how far they're going with this nonsense. He has chafed legal traditionalists from the movement, from the moment of his swearing in. Uh, which was the picture of which was shared the other day. But get this, he was sworn in when, how, under what circumstances? He opted for his ceremony to be held. Uh, this is even an option, right? Where are you going to be sworn in? Uh, no, no, you don't have an option. You come to the court building where the Fifth Circuit sits and the clerk holds a Bible. That's the one nod to traditionalism. And you take this, you take the oath, the end, right? No, I get to do whatever I want. And what's he going to do? I mean, this should have been a signal. I want my swearing in to be in the private library of Harlan Crow. Yes, Harlan Crow, the conservative mega donor who ProPublica revealed has lavished Clarence Thomas and maybe some other people with trips on his yacht and paid the $6,000 per month private school tuition for the justice's great nephew. Ho worked as a clerk for Thomas in 2005. And guys, I got for first, guess he got first row, first hand view of just what fabulous things were being lavished upon him or got wind of it later on and said, I want it too. My swearing in won't be in the public building in which I'll serve the public, but rather in Harlan Crow's private library, because after all, I'm going to be serving him, not the public. That should never have been allowed to happen. Now, I mean, maybe it's a, and maybe we misunderstood it. And maybe it is, in fact, that officially speaking, he was sworn in by the chief judge of the Fifth Circuit in the building, but he wanted to have a ceremonial swearing in where he could do whatever he wants, wherever he wants. And I mean, what are you going to do? If you got sworn in that way, and then you want to, if you want to spend the next weekend getting sworn in at a Kansas City Chiefs game, can anybody stop you if you're not really being sworn in? You're just staging. I brought a book with me to the Chiefs game. That's dumb, but I did. And I want my picture taken with the book. What are you going to do? I don't know. We should find out more about that, I guess. Ho vowed to boycott hiring Yale Law School graduates as clerks. How about that? After students interrupted conservative speakers on campus. Noting cancellations and disruptions seem to occur with special frequency at the Ivy League school. That's pretty funny, given that it wasn't wasn't it at Yale Law School where uh, we learned that uh, there was a professor, at, uh, a husband and wife professor team that were like essentially, really, to use the word correctly, grooming uh, uh, 
top conservative law school students for these positions so that they could uh, mutate into wackadoodles of power later on. Uh, yes, it was. So, you know, I can't be too sad about them dismantling that program, except that there are probably also, you know, liberal leaning uh, top students who are being deprived of these opportunities too. But uh, you'll probably land on your feet, Yale. You know? Anyway, moving on. His caustic writings have drawn the spotlight while his wife, Allison, has been working more inconspicuously, helping lay the legal foundation for conservative policies in her own work. She appears frequently as a speaker for the Federalist Society, of course, the group that has led the conservative effort to reshape the judiciary. She has also worked pro bono for Christian right organizations like First Liberty Institute, a group that describes its mission as to defend and restore religious liberty in our schools for Christians and only special kinds of that for our churches and houses of worship, unless they're not our Jesus ones inside the military and throughout the public arena. It's unclear what Alliance Defending Freedom paid Allison Ho to do. Never mind that her name is Ho, but okay, that's probably not what they were paying for. They were paying for legal services, presumably. Yet, ending abortion is central among the organization's goals. The group helped write the Mississippi law that led to the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe v. Wade and ended the 50-year constitutional right to an abortion. Her husband's financial disclosures list descriptions of Academy or Freedom Summit next to some of the payments. The ADF hosts various legal trainings as part of its ADF Legal Academy that, quote, seamlessly combines outstanding legal training with an unwavering commitment to Christian principles and a Young Lawyers Academy. In other words, teaching judges how to get away with doing the things that Judge Ho does. The Alliance Defending Freedom said ADF often invites lawyers of various backgrounds and experiences to speak at events, like Anybody who's married to a judge could come. doesn't matter whether they're black or white. ADF offers honorariums for speaker participation. That's the mechanism they use to pay her. Allison Ho is an exceptional lawyer, probably true, with vast and diverse legal experience. A request to speak with Allison Ho sent to Gibson Dunn has not been answered. The Texas Senators Ted Cruz and John Cornyn, both Republicans, appointed Allison to the state's committee responsible for recommending and vetting its recommendations to fill judicial vacancies. So she gets to pick judges. Neither Cruz nor Cornyn's offices responded to the Guardian's request for the names or dates of service for the judicial vetting committee, nor did they respond to questions about what role, if any, Allison had in her husband's nomination to the bench. How interesting would that be? In 2023, the Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, the actual Texas Attorney General, not the mistaken identification I gave earlier, hired Allison and Gibson Dunn at the rate of $1,313 per hour, for whatever reason, 1313 I don't know if that means anything, with a $7 million cap. Why? To represent the state in a decade-long legal battle in which the federal a federal judge determined Texas had failed to protect foster children. Why aren't we're protecting the children from abortion once they're born? Mm, not so much. I'll defend that. The state had previously been represented by attorneys on its own payroll. The move to hire Allison and her firm signaled that Texas could be looking to fight back against court orders mandating that Texas comply with federal monitors appointed to ensure the safety of vulnerable children, which I thought they were into. Uh, vulnerable children in its care, of course. By appealing district court rulings to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, that court on which James Ho serves. They just decided, instead of using our own lawyers, we'll hire outside counsel. The outside counsel we'll hire uh, is married to a member of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, to whom we would probably take our case later on. I'm sure. Nothing to see here. The Mifepristone case might just be the beginning of the Ho's influence. Gillers, the New York University professor, said... If Trump wins the election, you'll see Ho on the short list of nominees to the Supreme Court, he said. He's obviously behaving in a way that makes him very a very prominent candidate in a Republican administration. That is, being sworn in at Harlan Crow's house. That appointment could once again leave an empty office. That is to say, an office on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. One that some might want Allison. 
to fill. Wouldn't that be something? <clears throat> Husbands on the Supreme Court and wife on the Fifth Circuit. Nothing to see here. Move along. Okay, getting towards the end of today's show. Uh, let's see, other things to uh, uh, go through. Well, some of these things that are long reads that are, I guess, good compliments to the weird cabal stories that we read about uh, as with the Society for, what was it, uh, American Civic Renewal, a couple of other similar organizations and trainings that are run by right-wing lunatics that we might want to catch up on. But we'll use the balance of today's show for a little bit of international politics. Um, news yesterday reported by NPR that, uh, oh, well, let's see, the headline has changed here. Is this, uh, but, but, but the, the story is the same. The UN Security Council finally did uh, manage to pass a call for a ceasefire, but we heard the other day that the United States was going to make this request of the Security Council, and they did. And I, I said, I don't know what's going to happen here. Uh, it may be, I wonder if Russia and or China would sort of troll the proceedings by vetoing, using their their permanent Security Council membership status to veto the ceasefire call from the United States so that the United States got no credit for it or, I don't know, for whatever their reason might be. Uh, and they did. They did veto it. And so the uh, Security Council had to get another such motion to consider put in front of it. And uh, I guess this is the answer to the trolling issue. Uh, yes, so it was brought up again. And this time the United States um, abstained from the vote, which I guess was all the cover that the Russians and Chinese needed to, you know, I guess they would agree to not veto the resolution if the United States would step out of it such that they could still point and say, sure, there's now a ceasefire call from the UN Security Council, but the United States is so hypocritical that they wouldn't even vote for it, which means they're still pro-genocide, which means you can still continue to hate them and something, something. And that was the price of it. And here the United States uh, appears to have taken the approach of, well, if it gets us to the ceasefire call, it's annoying, it's embarrassing, but only to people who want it to be embarrassing for the United States, but we'll do it because it's better to get this resolution through. Uh, the headline on this NPR piece that I chose um, was yesterday, the UN Security Council has approved a ceasefire resolution for Gaza, now stands as Israel cancels high-level talks in Washington after ceasefire vote clears the UN. Uh, and that, too, may have been part of the aim of the other um, adversarial uh, permanent members of the Security Council in getting it to around to this point. Let's cause tension between the United States and Israel. All right. Uh, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Diaz and uh, Michelle Kellerman are the reporters for NPR who are responsible for this piece. The United Nations Security Council has voted 14 to nothing in favor of a resolution demanding a ceasefire in Gaza for the rest of Ramadan. That's the situation right now. The United States abstained from the vote, clearing the way for the measure to pass. And I think that's what uh, I, I think we might have understood the dynamics correct. I don't know whether they're going to offer an explanation, but let's see. The U.S. decision to abstain drew a swift response from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who canceled a visit by an Israeli delegation that had been set to travel to Washington, D.C. for talks on Israel's planned military operation in Rafa in southern Gaza. Hmm, whoop de doo I mean, not... Uh, we we don't want this operation to go forward, but they were, oh no, they're not going to come here and talk to us about it and refuse to acknowledge that they have to be careful? Okay, well, big deal. Prime Minister Netanyahu made it clear last night that if the U.S. withdraws from its principled position, uh, previously defending them from such ceasefire calls, 
He will not send the Israeli delegation to the U.S. In light of the change in the American position, Prime Minister Netanyahu decided the delegation would not go, the Prime Minister's office said in a statement. Okay, getting towards the end here. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller said Netanyahu's statement was a bit surprising and unfortunate. The U.S. abstention was seen as a sign of a growing rift between the two close allies. Washington is urging Israel not to launch the offensive on Rafah where more than a million Palestinians are sheltering. Israel says it has to go in to destroy remaining Hamas battalions there. The high-level delegation, led by Strategic Affairs Minister Ron Dermer and National Security Advisor Tzahi uh, Hanegbi, was due to meet with Biden administration officials to hear U.S. concerns over the Rafa operation and discuss an alternative strategy. That might have been nice. But it's not working. Despite the cancellation, a planned visit by the Israeli Defense Minister, Yoav Gallant, continued. He was in Washington on Monday to meet with Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. What does the resolution say? Ceasefire calls for, uh, or resolution calls for immediate, unconditional release of all hostages. And uh, let's see. Uh, Israel's military offensive on Gaza in response to the attack uh, which has, of course, killed more than 32,000 Palestinians uh, versus the attack of October 7th, which it correctly notes uh, killed 1,200 people. We understand the tensions on both sides. Ramadan is set to end in just over two weeks on April 9th. So if any ceasefire does manifest from the vote, it may only be short-lived. That's true. And uh, I think they're talking about uh, some U.S. had supported calls for ceasefire only if it were directly connected to the release of some remaining 130 hostages still in captivity. So just making sure we understood the terms of what was being called for, even if we don't get to uncover, even if this article addresses the uncomfortable situation as between all the players here. All right, time now, though, to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. He's got an entirely different lineup. All set to go. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there's 100% overlap. Let's check it. I'll get back to you after this brief announcement. From NetworksRadio.com You have been listening to k in the Morning with David Walton. All right, let's jump over to here where he's got a lineup on a story on a Kansas man suing a Republican congressman from Tennessee who falsely claimed that he, the Kansas man, was an illegal alien who carried out the mass shooting at the Kansas City Super Bowl parade. I'd like to see that one settled, and so would you. Stay tuned. Next.